Welcome to uh, a lecture on time series for data science. This is Data 601, uh, normally held at UMBC. I'm Ben, I'll be your instructor today. So I'm going to switch over to the notes and then we'll occasionally be switching over to some Jupyter notebooks. Alright, so if you've been attending 601 so far, you've been through a few classes. Here's sort of like a, a review of what we've been working on and then a preview of a few topics that will be coming up next. If you've uh, worked on project two, hopefully you've got your proposal either finalized or submitted for the project. Um, if you have questions on that, I'm available via email. If you review the rubric for the project, hopefully that shouldn't look too different from project one. Um, and so what I wanted to emphasize basically is that Again, as with project one, it's a challenge because everyone's at a different sort of learning rate and learning level um, that I want you to be able to challenge yourself, but I can't tell you what exactly that challenge is. So this is basically like things that you are unable to do and things that you can do easily. So I wanna find the middle balance between like things that challenge you um, and cause you to struggle, but also learn. So. If you're wondering what would make a successful project in 601, um, basically what would be something that would impress your audience? What is, and so this is my, my look of awe and su surprise and amazement here is basically you want to wow your audience. You want to say, that is amazing. I didn't know that that was possible. I didn't know that you could do that. That's very impressive. So those are the sort of like emotional reactions you're aiming for. So. When I'm writing up the, the rubric for the project, it's hard to sort of capture that sense, but that's typically what you want your audience to walk away with. Some sense of respect and, and um, new insight gained. Okay, again, if you have questions on project two, I'm available via online interaction or via phone call or email. So from today's lecture, we're gonna focus on time series data. And so we'll discuss about what time series means and um, what typically you sort of see in terms of trends and seasonality. So we'll talk about those patterns we see there. At UMBC, there are many classes on time series, and this is because time series are both very common and very complicated. So if you walk away from the lecture this evening thinking, wow, I've got this down, it's pretty straightforward, um, just think of the fact that there's an entire semester in multiple different departments focused on time series data. It's a really deep field and a very important field. So if, if this is something that you are excited by, there's certainly more opportunities to learn more about time series. All right, so we will cover um, sort of like a really quick introduction to what is timestamp data, and then we'll move on to like, why does it matter? The really, you know, time series data or timestamp data that looks like maybe it's a strange concept, but you've already seen it. And basically think of it as a column where you have a time, either like a, a you know, 11 a.m. or maybe a date, and then some event. And so typically this is either a string or a numeric value or a categorical variable. And so you think, oh, this is like a series, right? A series in pandas has an index and some value that goes with it. So Interestingly, this series data is just time series, right? So there's even a name intersection there. All right, so this is just the data structure, basically, the concept. Now, if you want to make multiple different observations, maybe you have multiple sensors or things going on at the same time or at the same uh, time marker, maybe you could put those different observations in a row and then you'd have multiple variables as columns and now we're getting back to a table and we're like, huh, it seems like maybe a, a library like pandas could handle a data frame and it will just have an index where the index rather than being integer is a times a timestamp. So that's, that's basically all the tools that you've built up in Python pandas are immediately applicable to time series data, which is very powerful. So that's pretty exciting. So now that we've sort of like understood the data structure and we've uh, seen that we have the tools to actually handle that, now let's think about what actual time series data we might encounter in the wild. 
So I want you to pause the video um, after this slide here and, and write down on a piece of paper what example of time series you can think of. So we've already talked about the data structure. It's a timestamp like as an index and then some values that go with that. So pause the video here and I'll give you a moment and we'll write down what those uh, time series candidates are on paper and then we'll come back in a minute. All right, so either you pause the video or uh, you're just skipping over that activity, but in either case, let's think about maybe what what different things would we observe um, in a, you know, maybe someone would give us a data set that is a time series. So I'll give you some examples, maybe a stock market pricing, right? So like I have every day there's uh, a specific like stock, like say Google or Amazon that has a price. Right, and so that is a, a scalar numerical value. And so we want to uh, associate that with a given time. Um, and so a stock market price, even though it's a scalar value, has a timestamp associated with it. And so therefore we could ask, what's the, time, what's the value of the stock at 11 a.m.? What's the value of the stock at noon? At 1 p.m. at 2 p.m. right and on a given day so maybe it's every stock price on Tuesday on Wednesday on Thursday and Friday right and it's like you have this value and timestamp maybe we'll go with uh, the crop yields right so like every year there's a certain amount of corn produced so again that's a scalar value but it's associated with a year and so if you say the amount of corn produced in 2002 amount of corn produced in 2003, amount of corn produced in 2004, right? So like we can build up a series of data uh, with those numerical values and the timestamp. And then in addition to sort of like um, those sort of common examples, I typically turn to sort of sensors. And so whether that means like camera pictures or maybe there's some measurements in a medical device or an industrial control system where like I'm generating a bunch of power and I need to say how much power is generated at what time. Right? So maybe I have a heart rate monitor that's measuring the heart rate at a given time. That's a timestamp data. And then even you can go so far as to say like um, when I watched an event, maybe that would matter in uh, making a recommendation to someone. So like uh, I watched this long ago. Um, having some timestamp associated with the data or having it in sequential order um, might be relevant to your recommendation. All right, so I just sort of made the point that sometimes order matters. And so order um, is usually an indicator that uh, there is a time dependence, although not necessarily always the case, right? So. Um, well, that, that gives us a way of distinguishing whether we think a series of data is time ordered or just a random sequence of observations. So to contrast with our pre previous examples of time ordered data, if I surveyed a bunch of people about whether they have a dog or not, I might represent that in a, in a series format of like, this person reported they have a dog. This person reported they don't have a dog. This person reported they do have a dog. And so even though that's a series data like with an index, say of like the name and a value of yes or no for whether they have a dog or not, the order of the dog survey um, doesn't matter. It's so like you could shuffle the order of that list of that series and it wouldn't change the outcome of your analysis. Whereas if you're looking at stock market data and you shuffled the sequence it would not represent um, the, the story as equivalently. So basically it comes on the idea of whether you can shuffle the list of events or not, um, that distinguishes it as a time series data. So let's look at an example of that. All right, so I'm pulling up my notebook here. All right, and so the, the primary point um, that you can quickly visualize whether or not order matters is a, a technique called the lag plot, lag. So the idea is you look at all the um, 
the pairs of uh, associ uh, adjacent values, and you look at the difference between those, and you can sort of figure out whether or not there's an ordering that matters. Okay, so I'm going to import pandas and numpy and matplotlib for visualization. I'm going to make some data. So let's actually run the cells here. Okay, so I'm going to start by just plotting um, the, the number t. So t is going on the x-axis here from 2 to 3. Um, that's the numpy range. And then I'm plotting the value y uh, on the y-axis here. So this is incrementing with my t value by according to this formula. So nothing sort of like crazy here. We're just looking at um, this, this data in a visualization plot. All right, so now let's make a lag plot. And the lag plot sort of confusingly looks similar to what we were just looking at, but the axes are different. And so what this is showing us is for the original plot we had t versus y on the plot, and now it's the same shape, but it's showing us y at a given t and the next y value. So this is y at a given t, so let's look at that, that first point. So let's look at time equals 2, so y equals 13. So our first value is um, 2 for our input, and then the next value is 2.1. So that, that is incrementing here, and then that's showing up as 2 to 2.1. That's the, the, the y-axis value here. So there was um, a single data point, and then our next data point is the difference between 2.1 and 2.2. So that's just incrementing there. And so you're like, well, that doesn't tell us anything new. But the, the important sort of observation here is that these sequences are linearly increasing. So like there's a, there's a straight line here uh, that's sloped upwards. This is indicating that the order matters. All right. So let's look at another plot, make it hopefully a little bit more clear. So I'm going to plot a sine curve. So this sine curve, and we're going to measure three cycles, and we're going to measure 500 measurements in those three cycles. And so this is our t value. And then we're going to um, randomly sort of like move, move it around a little bit. So this is our, our wave, right? That's a sine curve. And then what we're basically going to ask with a lag plot is, does the order of these points matter? Right, so we'll run that same lag plot analysis, and we get something back that looks really weird, right? I mean, like this is this is sort of unexpected but what it tells us is the difference between the associated uh, points on the plot and again what we get is this um, uh, line that's sloped upwards to the right so that is a an indicator that the time order does matter now there's some artifact patterns here of these little concentric, concentric circles um, those aren't relevant to the lag plot analysis all we really care about is the fact that this is this is not a random distribution of points. All right. So with that in mind, let's see if we do put in a random distribution of points. What does happen? So here I have a Gaussian distribution. So this is uh, there's a set of points that are sort of centered around uh, five in this case, and then they're spread out. So like this point here, and the next point have no relation to each other. They were both independently picked from a distribution, but after that, the order of these points does not matter. So this is what that distribution looks like when I plot 500 data points. And so we can sort of, even though we can visually sort of see that there's more points centered around five and there's fewer points at 40 and negative 20, let's use a histogram to sort of see what that distribution looks like. So a histogram is showing us Basically, the, the same visualization of 
there's more dense, a higher density of points around 5, and there's fewer density of points around 30 and negative 10. So that's what the histogram shows us, that there is a distribution. But the, the new sort of feature that we can look at is in the lag plot, what is the difference between the associated points, uh, between the adjacent points? And here, unlike the previous lag plots where we saw like a very clear um, sloped line, here the distribution of plot points is very uh, spread out. There's, there's no sort of correlation between the points. And that tells us that this is not a series that is ordered in the, in the sequence of data. All right, so we can make that potentially a little bit more clear by adding a few more points. So if I rerun the same plot and then look at the hit, so here now it's harder to, because there are so many points, it's harder to see what the actual distribution is. But we can go back to that histogram, and the histogram very clearly shows us that this is a nice bell curve, so a Gaussian distribution. And again, if we look at the lag plot, we will not see any um, sort of diagonal line. All the points are spread out across the entire plot, so therefore this is not an ordered series of data. Okay, so that is in contrast to when we looked at something like this where there was a very clear diagonal line cutting across um, the lag plot. And back here, there was a very clear diagonal line, which means the series order does matter. Basically, the consequence of all this is to say that if you were to have a set of random points uh, that you're looking at, maybe like a survey of dog owners, the order in which you look at those rows in your data frame does not matter. Whereas if you look at something like a, a sine wave, the order along the, in a given column does matter. All right, so um, that's like a very distinguishing characteristic of time series data. Now that we've sort of like figured out what is a distinguishing feature, we'd ask, why do we care? Right? It's like, uh, why would I spend time trying to figure out whether or not a time series is, or whether a series is time ordered or not? And and uh, the reason, going back to that, there are like three different classes at UMBC focused entirely on time series, is because that's where almost all the sort of intelligence and and insight can be gained from, right? So you want to tell a story, and the stories typically have some dependence on time in them. And so if you want to make an extrapolation or some sort of uh, predictive analysis, you need to figure out what is the time order of events. So a couple examples of that. Suppose that I um, were in charge of providing electricity in Texas. I'd want to know or have some sense of what sort of swings in the power distribution there are. Right. So like this, the amount of power in gigawatts is fluctuating. So it's a billion watts is fluctuating between 30 and 70. So that might seem like a lot, right? So it's like a big swing, right? A factor of two um, in my electrical load on a daily basis, right? And so the trick there is I said daily, right? You'll see that this pattern occurs every 24 hours. And so actually, even though it's a giant swing, it's predictable. And that's encouraging because then you can say, well, we know when to schedule maintenance, or we know what sort of capacity load planning to make, or we know what, when an anomaly occurs. And so if you can say there is actually a trend, the trend is to oscillate. And that oscillation has a very clear sort of um, correlation with time, then we can make predictions about that oscillation. You might also be familiar with uh, the weather if you've ever been outside. Um, <laughs> there are oscillations uh, that change on a night to day basis. Right? So like your weather is typically cooler at night rather than hotter in the day. Um, so that's one example. And then typically people care about um, the forecast on the weekends, say versus the weekdays, where there might not be a correlation with the weather because the weather doesn't care what day of the week it is. But that's when people care more about it. So you can see here, like the the forecaster um, being the forecast being presented has a different distinguishing characteristic for p things that people value more. So even if your time series um, doesn't actually have 
uh, a dependence on the weekend, people may care about that fact more than others. And again, just the, the observable things that you have experienced with are pretty straightforward as far as understanding why the time series matter, but also all the um, voice recognition or video processing that you, you enjoy as leisure, um, that is also time series data. So having ways of handling time series data for video and voice is definitely useful. All right, so now hopefully I've convinced you that there's some reason to care about time series um, and we've uh, established that it's useful, but what do we do, right? So like we, we, we probably wanna do a few of these characteristic um, tasks in, in, with time series data. The first is to figure out, is there a trend? This goes back to like prediction and like trying to figure out what's gonna happen next, right? So if you can identify a trend, that's important. Sort of second order to that, you can say, is the trend changing? So we've observed this behavior, is the behavior consistent or not? And then you, once you say, well, yeah, there is a pattern, then you can start asking more important questions like, what's the noise versus like, what's the uncharacteristic behavior? And so that's a very challenging um, distinguishing task of like, if you can say there's a pattern, then you can say there's noise, but distinguishing something unusual from the noise, that's where the, the real money gets made. And all of this, this applies to basically like a single time series data. So like back where we had a single timestamp in one column and then a value in another column, that's called univariate data. So there's just one time series. Where it gets really complicated is when you have multiple time series data interacting. Right? So maybe you have like traffic patterns um, of like people driving on roads, that might be a time series. And then maybe you have a time series like the weather, right? So like the weather changes from day to night, maybe when it's raining versus not raining. And so that's the interaction of multiple time series, that's multivariate analysis, is uh, again, very important and, and challenging. All right, <laughs> you might sense a recurring theme in 601, and that is almost all of our time will be spent on data cleanup and then characterization, and then more cleanup and more characterization. So let's look at what sort of challenges exist with data cleanup? <laughs> there is a lot of um, subjective choice in, in creating time series data, and that subjective choice on the person on the on the person creating the data means that there's a lot of cleanup to do. If there were only one way to present the data, then we wouldn't have to clean anything up. So as an example, just again, remember this is for a single time series data, right? So like if you're in on the East Coast and you're talking to someone on the West Coast, which one of those parties would um, record the timestamp and would they even denote which time zone they're in? And then if you have two different people talking back and forth, are they on the same clock? Does the clock, um, is it, does it keep accurate time, right? Does, it, does the battery run low and it runs a little slower, right? Uh, and then we'll get into timestamp formats shortly, but as a quick preview of that, um, there's lots of different conventions, right? So like a convention of, I know that there's a given hour and minute and day and a month and a day and a year, but how do I present those to the user? And, and the answer is it makes the most sense depending on who you're talking to. And so that gets back to that. So there's both a subject, subjective design choice and there's a consumer preference of what do they expect. Right? So maybe the, the convention depends on whether you're in Asia or Europe or the United States, right? Most United States folks um, might be looking for a year, year, month, month, day. Whereas maybe if you're in Europe or Asia, the, the conventional ordering is different. And then another subjective choice that a designer gets to make is to what granularity they're recording the time to. So maybe it's really important that I get down to the second, but then there's this trade-off of, well, if you're recording all this data, so the year, month, day, hour, minute, second, that's a lot of data, especially if you have billions of records in your logs. And so maybe it makes sense to save space, right? I make a trade-off, I'm saving space and I'm only gonna record 
the year, month, day, hour. And I'm not going to record the minute and second because those are extra data that just doesn't really add a lot of value. Um, but and it takes up space and I have to pay for storage capacity. So maybe I don't store all that data. Or I go the other direction and I say, of course you know what year it is. I'll just record the month, day, and hour. Well, now you're making an assumption, right? The assumption is that the user has some context to figure out what year it is. This is a classic Y2K problem, so year 2K. There was a, the assumption that everyone knows that it's 19 something, right? 1982, 1985, 1986. You know, and so why would I carry around that extra data about the one nine in front of the year because I already know it's going to be 19 something. Well, this caused a huge headache when the year rolled over from 1999 to 2000 because suddenly your computer thought that it was the year 1900 because the one nine was an implicit assumption. So you know, there's sort of trade-offs in both sort of year and second, and then you can get in these weird conversations about is what's the best way to store the month value? Is it is it January or the word Jan? Or is it one or zero one? Right? So like all those are equivalent in some sense. So <laughs> in some sense, this is great news. It means that as a data scientist, you have a ton of job security because all these decisions being subjective on both the designer and the consumer side means that you'll always have a job cleaning up date timestamp data. All right, so <laughs> that was all for sort of like a single data source, right? Now we get into these questions of like, well, what if you're combining data? Because that would be a very normal thing to do. Well, again, you have to think about timestamps. You have to think about is the timestamp local or is it UTC based? Cover what UTC is referring to. Are all the clocks synchronized, right? And so like, um, there's different ways of combining data, but it's almost always sort of like an art rather than a science. All right, so now you think, okay, we've solved all the problems. We've got the timestamps consistent. They're all in the same format. What could possibly go wrong, all right? Well, <laughs> here's the next problem. So the next problem is your data frame has rows, right? And every row either has um, a start time or a stop time or an instantaneous value. Like those are the choices. And so you have to figure out when I'm presented with a table of timestamp data, what exactly does a row mean? So that's, that's a real challenge, right? To figure out even sort of a definition of what a timestamp is referring to. So let's take an example of that in my temporal anomalies notebook. Right. So in this notebook, I have basically, uh, I was presented with a CSV um, and the, the time series data actually had two time, time columns. One was the start time and one was the end time. And so the challenge I was given was, can you demonstrate that all of these start time, stop times are consistent, that they're both contiguous and they're complete? So that means like, if, I, if, if one of the rows refers to the time 10 a.m. to 10.01 a.m., then the next row should be 10.01 a.m. to 10.02 a.m. Right, to make sure that there's a consistent coverage and that there's no gap. So I'm gonna, even though I was presented with a lot of data, I almost always start with just like, what's the simplest thing I can do on a single data set? So let's look at um, this one uh, set of data, I've sliced out all of the um, irrelevant patient data. So we're just looking at basically the, the timestamps. And so basically I have here basically a, a, a patient um, identifier and then a timestamp, right? So it's starting in seconds. And so it's starting at 1680 and then it's increasing to 1380, right? So this is their negative times. That's where we're moving forward. And then these are some columns which we sort of, in some sense, don't care about. Um, so all I was really focused on is the time begin and time end. And so the pattern that I'm trying to check is that this, uh, sorry, this time end here matches the next row because they're contiguous. 
and then I have to make sure that this one is the same as showing up here. And I have to sh show that all of these are um, covering all the time span. So let's look at the bottom. Bottom is basically similar of like, there's some amount of time being covered between here and here. And then uh, there's another 300 seconds elapsed. So 300 seconds in this case is five minutes. So three, five minutes elapses and then the next time starts. All right, so hopefully that's sufficient background. All right, so the during tour closest to, this is a sanity check that I knew to run, so I could just run that. Um, it's not really relevant to the time series analysis. And an assumption that I had was that each of the entries in this column should be unique, right? So there shouldn't be any duplicates in the time begin, nor should there be any duplicates in the time end. So it's like a pretty straightforward check. We can show that there are in fact 93 entries that are unique in both the begin and end. And then let's make a plot here. So we've got all the timestamps should increment. So this is basically saying that as the uh, rows are increasing in index, I want the time to be increasing, right? So remember it was back in 16, negative 1680 seconds. So that's some number of uh, minutes. And so I converted it over to hours. Let's see what exactly that was doing that. So I took the time begin and the time end. Uh, so the time begin index and I took the time end in seconds and divided by 60 to get back to minutes and then another 60 to get back to hours. So that is showing that the time does really increment as we'd expect. This is another sanity check on time series data. All right, so the next question is if we look at all of the differences between the two columns, let's see what that would, would expect. Uh, so I'd, I'd have the difference between these two is 300, and the difference between these two is 300, and the difference between these two is 300. So every row should be the same difference of uh, 300 seconds. So let's plot that. I'm going to plot the uh, difference in minutes. So I plot, oh, look at that. There's a there's an issue. So I've got time series data where the two columns should be uh, separated by five minutes. And that's almost always the case, except for a single data point where there was uh, a, a data point that, uh, a, t a row that had less than five minutes elapsed. So that's, that's anomalous, right? We can clearly see that. So then we can ask which row had that outlier. And so we see that between this timestamp and this timestamp, the difference is not 300 seconds, it's 280. So that's interesting. So let's look at, so remember this was row 38. So now we can take a look at the adjacent rows and ask, we went from 9,420 to 9,720. So that was in five minutes. And then there's a, there's a contiguous row, which is, there's no gap between this value and this value. And then this is where the, the difference of 480 occurred. And then we're again increasing 300. So it, the, even though there was an anomaly in the amount of time being recorded, the adjacent rows are contiguous. So, so let's <laughs> take a look at, um, are there any other sort of areas where we'd expect, even though there was a five minute, uh, difference between the given row, are there any instances where adjacent rows are not contiguous? So we, the way to sort of ask that question, and this is not a precise way of doing it, but it's just sort of like first pass, we can sort of see that this number appears in both columns, and this number appears in both columns. So if we treat these columns as lists and then convert them to sets, we can say, um, is there are there other numbers that only appear in one column? And so you'd expect the very first value and the very last value to only appear once. And that is what we find here, that there are uh, pairs of numbers in every, uh, in both columns. Okay, so then at this point, there's like, okay, I've looked at one CSV from a pool of 6,000 CSVs and I already found one anomaly. So then it becomes a very quick question to ask, if we rerun all of the same analysis on another separate data set, 
do we get the same sort of like behavior or does this happen to be a coincidental outlier? And so here I, I chose another uh, data set from that same pool of 6,000 and I find another outlier. Again, it's um, 20 seconds short of five minutes and it's not at the same row. So that, that row there was like um, probably about 38, I believe. And down here, it turns out that the difference occurred at 33. So, so the row number is not consistent, but the anomaly is consistent. And then we'll do it for another one. And then now we've found something where, oh, we also found an anomaly. It's at a different position. Let's see where that is. At 35. Um, but here it's 20 seconds longer. So we, at this point, this is a really perfect time to turn to our, um, our data supplier and ask, hey, did you know about this anomaly? And do they have an explanation for that fact that that's always 20 seconds off, but sometimes it's more than 20 seconds and sometimes it's less than 20 seconds. So this is like your role as a data scientist performing data exploration is in some sense done. Like you've found that there's an anomaly, it's time to stop and ask the customer what is going on here. So this isn't to say you should do this for every data set, it's just to say you should validate that your timestamps behave as you'd expect. All right, so now that we've sort of identified some anomalies, let's look at the actual details of the timestamps themselves. In the, in the previous notebook, we were using seconds, so it was pretty straightforward. All right, time for an activity. Quick activity for you to write down a piece of paper. We'll pause the video and then come back. I want you to write down today's date, time, and day on your piece of paper. So do that. We'll pause the video and, and start playing again when you have an answer. All right, welcome back. Um, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna aggregate those on paper, but uh, we don't have all everybody together in the same room, so I'll just write down some examples. So <laughs> although I ask for the day, date, and time, um, I almost always get answers that don't actually adhere to the guidelines. So <laughs> there's a few examples here, but typically you'll see something like Tuesday or twos or twos for the period, right? Or maybe it's the date, maybe it's the date and the year, or maybe it's the time, or maybe it's the date and the year and the time, but not the, you know, now you're missing the year. So like basically <laughs> whenever you ask someone to implement something, they'll come up with their own independent conclusion of what the right answer is. None of these are in some sense wrong. Like they're, they're all accurately reflecting the now but maybe they don't adhere to the guidelines specifically, or maybe the guidelines weren't specific enough about how they wanted that, that presentation. All right, so if you look back at the activity, I didn't say, should you use the word Tuesday or an abbreviation twos, right? So in some sense, it's the fault of the person providing the guidelines, not being sufficiently specific. Okay, so you've got all these different formats and you presented these uh, in your data set and you ask, what is the right way to sort of get all these to, to be the same thing? Because right? we, we think as humans that these are all equivalent representations. Again, all this goes back to the fact that it's subjective. There's different assumptions being made. Maybe the constraints are underspecified and there's trade-offs being made. So that's the reason for all of this disparity. So happily, you're not the first person to run into this problem. So other people have run into the problem and they've written libraries to deal with this problem. So that's super handy. And to go even further, there's specialized formats that people allow you to specify the sort of standard conventions in. So let's go take a look at that. So all the things that I sort of like captured um, in my examples of, the t of what now is, they're sort of captured in this sort of language or some variant of it. So Maybe I have a day of the week or I have an abbreviated day of the week. Right? Um, maybe I have the month, maybe I have an abbreviated month. The year could either be four digits or if you wanna incur uh, a problem every 100 years, maybe you go with just a two value, two numerical value there. Pretty common question is, you know, should I pad my single digit characters with a zero? You know, that's totally subjective. So do I go 24 o'clock, do I go 12 o'clock? Right, so all of these, the point here is that these are permutations that people have seen before, and so they've come up with a way of 
denoting in their own little special syntax what that what that is. And so it means like if you see this, you can say any month adhering to that sort of convention, I'll just denote as percent %d. So we'll come back how to use this sort of specialized code later on. And in the end, what you're going to get back, hopefully, is something that looks like this. And so this is like the standard date time format. Um, and so I don't actually care what the numbers represent because I can always extract out of it um, a, a representation and some more meaningful syntax. All right, so that was sort of one problem of dealing with this thing is that there's a specialized uh, library to go with that, those problems. Uh, and so another challenge that you'll invariably run into is timestamps. So uh, timestamps, uh, sorry, time zones are, are used across the world so that everybody's noon is at midday. So it's sort of like when the sun is in the middle of the sky, we call that noon. But that doesn't work because the Earth is a big old sphere, and so what looks like noon to me may look like uh, let's say it'd be early morning on the West Coast. Um, and so we have these time zones, and so there's there's only 24 of those, right? Well, actually there's 37, but that's sort of weird. So <laughs> it's sort of like that little fact there of like there's not actually 24 time zones, there's 37. Should just like scare you a little bit, right? Because like time zones are so messy and this is just sort of like the first indicator. So a pretty standard way of dealing with this is to use universal coordinated time or UTC. Um, and so that's basically every time zone is an offset with respect to this sort of coordinated time. So let's look at time zones here for a moment. So I'm going to use a library, because I don't like inventing things from scratch, called PyTZ. It's very handy. Um, and I'll import that along with datetime. So the datetime library, um, it's that standard representation that we were talking about uh, with the time format. So I can ask, what is the time now according to datetime? And I get back uh, something that looks really weird like that. Right? So I don't know what to do with that, but the handy thing is, I can say uh, all these different options from date to day, those are now features that are available. So why don't I pick out, uh, let's say day. And I get back to 22, right? So now I see, okay, it's March 22nd. That's probably what this is referring to. And then obviously, like again, I can see what other options there are. Let's go with our. And so from the hour, that's 16, so it's really 4.15 p.m., but this is sort of like a 24-hour clock. So um, <laughs> these are the different features available in that date-to-day -day variable. All right, so if I want to get the, the time zone sort of explicitly added, I can use the as time zone, so that adds in so here we're just saying like this is the local time, so 1615. Um, and so the actual 415 p.m. is not what time it is. If you see, I don't know if you can see my clock up here, it's 1216. So like, where is that coming from? Well, it's actually uh, the time zone here is UTC by default in the date time. And so I want to convert, even though this is saying that it's uh, 4, 4 16 p.m., it's actually 12, 16 p.m. local. All right, so I want to tell the date time library that I'm hanging out on the East Coast. And so therefore, the actual time is 12, 16 p.m. So that, that is now an accurate reflection of what time it is. And it's specifying that we're in the East Coast time zone. So I can still get back the hour and the day, and now the hour is correct. I'm looking back second microsecond. Okay, so basically this is a, a very good choice of how to deal with um, a, a timestamp format that can be converted in Python to any other representation that you care about. So we'll show that shortly in, in a strip time.
So one more warning about um, time, zone, time zones. So the time zones on, in the US shift every six months and that gets really annoying. Um, so it's just something to be aware of. Uh, we change over our clocks, shifting forward and shifting back by an hour, most places. <laughs> so there's some caveat there. The other sort of fun part is that um, everything is sort of locally dependent. So a, a municipality like a city or a county can um, set what their standard convention is for time zones and sort of dealing with the, the time changes. So everything is local. And so that, that makes it very hard when you're dealing with say national or worldwide data. All right, so we've encountered tons of different problems. And so you might be thinking, isn't there just one right way of doing things? And uh, date time gives you a sort of representation format, but another sort of, that's specific to Python. Um, so there's another solution, which is very common called epoch time. And so uh, this is widely used in Linux and also available uh, in Python to say, what is the number of seconds since a given time? Right, so that's the epoch. And so often the epoch is defined as January 1st in 1970. It's a very arbitrary date in some sense. You could, you could, you could choose any sort of uh, start date, right? And so like um, in Python, we can say import time. And when we do that, we're counting the number of seconds. So that's a that giant um, float value since a given date. And then you can use that the strip time library to convert a date time into an output format that looks more human readable. So I, I don't actually typically care about the number of seconds, but if I can convert that into uh, say a year, month, day, hour, minute, uh, second representation, that's handy. And so uh, the problem is, uh, if I go back to here, the problem is there's different epoch start times. And so whether you, whether you think it's, 1970 makes the most sense, or say 1900, or maybe uh, you know 1942. Like different um, organizations use different epoch start times, and that can be also very confusing. So I think, uh, like in the Google Chrome database um, for your browser history, uses a different epoch, 1970. So this is again a very subjective choice, and so different people adhere to different conventions and make your job sort of more challenging. All right, so now we'll do a little bit of visualization. All right, so we've already done a few visualizations of time series data, but uh, we'll do one more notebook um, with time series data. All right. So how do I take time series and visualize it? Well, I'm, I'm gonna start with pandas and matplotlib. And I happen to have um, this pickle, which is a PKL file uh, that I created from some old uh, analysis that I did on my, my laptop. So when I read that pickle in, I don't usually know what I'm getting back. Um, and so I can say, you know, let's, let's insert a new cell here to say, what is the type of this? So when I load this pickle in, I'm getting some random serialized data and I can say, oh, it's a list. Okay. So then I can ask, it's a list. How long is it? Okay. It's of length four. So then if I know it's a list of length four, let's do list of DF of zero and then type that. All right. So the zeroth element in my list is a dictionary. So then I can ask, what are the keys associated with that dictionary? Okay, so now I've got a bunch of keys in a dictionary. Let's look at um, the one called DF. So that one probably looks most interesting because I like data frames. And so it turns out that uh, it is in fact a data frame. So basically this is a pretty standard way of like, there's metadata and there's the data I care about. So I've got this data frame and a bunch of other information about that data frame stored as a dictionary of, and with one of the values being a data frame. Okay, so I've got the data frame loaded in from my list, and now I've got, oh boy, a whole bunch of things, right? So I've got, uh, let's look at the 
I'll look at the columns here. So you can sort of already see what's coming here. I've got 600 rows and 328 columns. So if I do columns here, I'm going to get back a whole bunch of stuff in Python. Or Pandas actually cuts me off as far as like the number of displayed things. But happily, we see that this is a CPU times guest, CPU one times guest. Nice, right? So there's a whole bunch of like columns with the last few one. Let's see, time in Unix seconds. All right, so this is exciting. It means that this is highly likely to be time series data in a pandas data frame with 600 rows and 328 columns, one of them being a timestamp. So that's the good part right there. So if you look at this, a lot of these columns are zeros, so we don't really care about them. But at the end, we have this time in Unix seconds. So that's referring to the epoch right, of 1970, January 1st, um, number of seconds since then. So that's, that's our timestamp. All right, so let's look at a simple plot of one of the columns. So I have, let's see if I can find the CPU one times user. Yeah, here we go. So here's a numeric column, some data in it. I'm gonna plot that uh, in my data frame. And what I hear, uh, what I get back, what I see here is the uh, index, not my timestamp. And so this is my the value variable that I care about, and these are the indices, not timestamps. So I want to change that over. Also, this is a line plot, and I have this thing against line plots because they interpolate data unnecessarily. So I'm gonna um, look at those actual values, and then let's do a scatter plot. So here's what a scatter plot looks like, and here's what's different about a scatter plot. Notice that this little thing happening around about 270. Uh, at the row 2 to 70, it wasn't clear whether there were actually multiple points there or just one point. But if we switch over to a scatter plot, we can actually see that this wasn't really a trend going up and down. This was a single outlier. And so that's like a different story, which is more easily interpreted as a scatter plot. So that's our first changeover. So then we have to figure out okay, if I have um, seconds and the word in a column, then it's probably a timestamp. And we already saw that, so I found uh, the relevant column. And so now let's look at that. Okay, that's a bunch of values. As we warned, that was sort of the time in seconds since 1970. So that's handy. And we can actually see, oh, that's pretty similar to like what we're observing over here. So these are in scientific notation. If you're not familiar with that, they have great Wikipedia articles on scientific notation. Basically, it's a long float. It's a it's a value uh, with multiple digits on either side of the radix. Okay, so now I want to substitute in in my uh, plot the timestamp. Okay, so that looks super weird. So remember, we were looking at um, seconds since 1970. So matplotlib doesn't um, want to show all those digits. Right, so like these this would be very long to include as the x-axis label. So it sort of shortens it by saying, oh, all of these are roughly one times 10 to the ninth. And so we'll just uh, present the leading digits here, which is not very uh, helpful. So what we want to do is we convert the Unix timestamp um, from seconds into something like a date time. And so we can do that using the UTC from date timestamp command and just take in, say, that first initial value. So let's see what that was up here. So we basically fed this float value to this argument and it got back a timestamp. All right, so now we did that. We, we just showed that we can do that for a single value, but we want to do that for every value in the entire column. So the way that I'm going to do that is I'm going to use a lambda function. And basically, this is a, a function that doesn't have a name, so it's a lambda function. And it takes in an argument. Um, so it so it takes in a single argument and it says, given uh, a numeric value, uh, run this this command against that single argument. So that is going to be what is gets returned, and so the return value from this argument is sent to a new column. So I'm applying um, 
pretty useful sort of conversion technique of taking a given column, making a change to it, and then storing it in a new column. So I'm not overwriting the old column, I'm preserving that there, I'm just adding in a new column. So this is something that um, applies very generically, the apply function um, is useful um, in many contexts where I want to make a change to a single value and then apply that same change to an entire column. Let's see what that does. All right, so when I apply that date time conversion to all of the entries in the date in the time in unit seconds, I get back a bunch of timestamps. So that's cool. That's exactly what we wanted. So let's see if there's um, anything else going on. We've got a date time and we go to time in unit seconds. So why is that? Now we've got um, these two columns, they're equivalent. That's good. And now we can pass in the date time as our, our, our x-axis. And so again, I just took that new column that we created and we can say uh, versus the variable that we're interested in. And we get back a slightly more sensical um, uh, picture in our, our plot. So here we have the day and the hour and the minute. So this was running for roughly 10 minutes of data collection and we're looking at the, the values there. Okay, so then we probably want to label it more clearly. Maybe we can slip the, rotate these. So here's a quick rotation equals 45. We're rotating those labels. All right, so that's, that's pretty straightforward. All right, so we have a new column basically uh, that we created called date time, but it's likely that for the 600 different, uh, or the, for the 300 different columns in this data set, we want to apply the same transformation. And so we can just change the index from um, the integers like it is now. So zero is the first row, one is the second row. We can change that to be the timestamps that we have. And then that'll make our job easier in the future to say, if I want to plot any of these values, I can just um, use the index date time. So to see what that sort of plays out into, let's go back to our original sort of plot here. I'm going to take my scatter plot with what had been the index. I'm going to change it over, see if this works.